We're so glad you've chosen to worship with us today. And before we get into the announcements, we just want to talk about something that really great happened last Sabbath. Well, this sermon series, we've been doing a challenge each week. And last week, the challenge was for you to pray about a name that God uh, had in mind for you to pray for intentionally about and intercede for. So at the end of the service, we had you come out to the foyer, those of you who could, to write that one name on a sticky note and put it on the back window. Many of you did it, as you can see from the footage here. We had many uh, individuals' names that went up on that wall. And you know what? Our staff has been praying this week over all of those names. We know that many of you were not here at Loma Linda University Church, but in your homes, you have names that you've been praying over. We are just really excited to join forces with prayer to lift up so many individuals who are in desperate need. And I am looking forward to hearing many reports and stories of answered prayers. Amen. Yeah, it was really cool as a whole staff. Even though it was hot in the foyer, oh, it was hot. We, were, Very. we were praying. It was really cool to see all those sticky notes on the, on the window. Well, another important ministry of this church is our UReach, and they're in need of volunteers. They're needing volunteers for Meals on Wheels and their transit ministry. Go to our website to find out more information. We really could use your help. And we want to invite you to come out to Family Fun Night. This Wednesday night will be the third Wednesday that Pastor Doug and his ministry have put on a wonderful time for all the families. It starts at seven o'clock with food and fun, and then eight o'clock is the movie, family movie Under the Stars. So come out and join us. And then finally, we're just around the corner for our annual camp meeting. And we've got a concert coming up. It's the Collinsworth family and tickets are going fast. It's a praise and worship evening. It's gonna be a wonderful concert. Go to our website to find out more information on that. And I believe it's August the 21st. That is correct. At seven o'clock. So just make note of that as you plan. Well, that's our announcements for today. For more information, of course, go to our website. We love each and every one of you. And from this very warm Loma Linda day, have a fantastic Sabbath.
Can I get an amen for that beautiful prelude? That's just beautiful. We want to say thank you for worshiping with us this morning. On behalf of the pastoral staff, thank you for being here. I know the Lord has a blessing for you. I hear him calling us to be disciples, not only in worship to him, but in communion with one another as we worship together. I can hear him calling me and you to set aside our distractions, to set aside whatever's happening in our life, and to focus on worship. Can I get an amen? amen. Okay, look at your neighbor left and right and just smile and nod. Yep, yep, happy Sabbath, yep. We're here to worship. I love that. See, we didn't touch anybody. We just smiled. That's good, and that's good. I know that the Lord has a very special blessing for us. I want to join our voice with the psalmist in chapter 73 where he says, my flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. So no matter what's happening in your life, God wants to be a part of it. And the joy that he brings is our portion. Thank you for worshiping here at Loma Linda University Church. And now won't you stand with me as we praise the Lord together.
Let us pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this time to be in your presence. Lord, we're thankful for the Sabbath day that allows us to rest and commune with you. We're thankful for your love and protection uh, that allows us to be here. Jesus, this morning we pray that we would recognize our deep need of you and of your cleansing blood in our lives as you are coming soon to take us home. Lord, this morning we ask for your Holy Spirit to be in our hearts and our minds and in this place. We ask that you will speak through Pastor Joey this morning as we continue to learn what it means to be disciples of you. May we be your hands and your feet today. We ask it all in Jesus' heavenly name. Amen. Happy Sabbath, friends. Sabbath. Oh, that was pretty good. I think we can do it better if we try one more time, Pastor Doug. Happy Sabbath, friends. Happy Sabbath. Amen, amen. You know, when I think of our new ministry building right next door and all of the bustling activity that takes place there every week, my heart is inspired. We have the You Reach ministry. We have the Anthem ministry. We have the media ministry. We have the wonderful Sabbath school classes. We have the children's ministry. We have seminars that help to train our members how to reach out to those who are in crisis or going through grief. And we have other many ministries there. And I'm telling you, it's absolutely amazing. And I want you to know that that ministry complex exists because of your faithful prayers and your systematic financial support. Someone say amen. If you look at the chart on the screen, you can see where we are now and where we yet have to go. And I think we ought to give God a praise clap for his mercy and goodness and helping us to achieve that goal. Amen, amen. You know, my dear mother always reminds me that only what we do for Christ and his kingdom will last. Only what we do for Christ and his kingdom will last. Do you believe that out there, someone? We may not all be able to preach, or to teach, or to sing, but each of us, each of us can pray and support financially in any way that we can to support the kingdom of God and to help to alleviate the pain and suffering of those in our community, amen? May God continue to bless us as we seek to um, um, be there as a source of inspiration to others and as we seek to increase the awareness of people by our tithes and our offerings and as we seek to do all that we can to say lord i'm an instrument in your hand use me in any way that you can to help your kingdom on earth so that we can prepare those for eternity is that okay amen, amen and god bless you Yes, I will stand in awe of you. And I'll let my words be few. Holy Spirit, I am so in awe of you. Never return. I've closed the door. 
be the same again. Fall like fire, soak like rain, flow like mighty waters again and again. Sweep away the darkness, burn away the child, and let the flame burn. all very busy and even though you're boys and girls and you're not grown up you have a lot of things you have to do every day let me show you something this is my heart it represents my heart and you have one too it's right here inside of you and we have to put good things into our heart good things into our lives so let's practice putting good things into our lives okay so all of these things represent some of the things that you have to do every day. And this big one is Jesus. Let's put things into our heart, okay? You have to go downstairs and have your breakfast. You have to be loving and kind to your brother and sister. Some of you have to practice an instrument. Who plays the piano? Hmm? Who plays the violin? Well, you have to practice. If you have a pet, 
you have to feed your kitty or your dog. Let's see, what else do we have to do? Oh, we have to play. You have to have time to play. And you also have to listen and obey. So we're gonna put all of these good things into our heart. See, it all fits. Uh-oh, I forgot something. The biggest and the best is Jesus, and I forgot to put him in my heart. Let's make sure we put him in now, okay? Everything we do is there. Now we're gonna put Jesus in, and we're going to close up our heart because I, uh-oh, there's a problem. It doesn't fit. When I put Jesus in my heart last, things don't fit. Hmm. Let me think about this. What can I do? Because all of these things I need to do, they're good things for me to do, right? I have an idea. Why don't I put Jesus into my heart first? Hmm. Let's see if everything else is going to fit, okay? Well, you still have to wake up and get dressed and brush your teeth. You have to go downstairs, eat breakfast, be nice to your brother and your sister. You still have to take care of your pet, walk the dog, feed the dog, feed the kitty. You have to have some time to play. That is so important. Hmm, what else did we talk about? Uh, practicing the piano or the violin. I know a lot of you have things to do like that. And you have to read, and you have to listen and obey, and you have to play. Mmm, looks kind of crowded, doesn't it? Well, let's see if this is going to fit. Look at that. Look at that. All of the things that we need to do, that we want to do, good things that we do, they will fit in our hearts if we put the biggest and the best in first. Can you remember to do that? Let's make sure we put Jesus into our hearts first, then all the other good things that we want to do. Today, Evan and Erica and Nolan and Ashley are publicly acknowledging uh, what they started a few years ago with their firstborn and now continue with their secondborn, Noemi Starr and Bowden Jeffrey, dedicating them to the Lord uh, this special Sabbath day. Uh, Evan and Nolan and their wives have been at this parenting thing for almost four years, and they know that uh, it takes all their effort and also the blessing of God to make this happen well, and so that's why they're here today. For Evan and Erica and for Nolan and Ashley, this service celebrates the privilege of parenting and also acknowledging, acknowledges the, the, the challenge and the interest they have in having God's strength and blessing in this wonderful privilege. God is intimately interested in this. Over and over again, Jesus was given little children to bless and to, to celebrate before God. And so that's why we're here today, because Jesus started that, and, and we're continuing it here today. And this dedication is also a statement of your interest and your care. As a church family, um, this is part of your responsibility. I know when, when we were raising our kids, my wife and I, and I'm sure it's the case for 
Linda and, and, and Peter and for Skip and Ruth. It, we were blessed by a wonderful church family that, that helped us raise our kids. And so um, it's, it's a privilege to be able to be here with you today to dedicate them. Now, I've been trying to get them to have this happen up in Walla Walla where we live, but so far that's not worked. They're still in Loma Linda, and they probably will be staying here for a long time. So, so thank you for your interest and your care for them. And before we have a prayer, I'd like to invite the other family members to, to stand just for a moment. Peter and Linda, the parents of uh, Erica, and Skip and Ruth Zalsman, the parents of Ashley. And let's, let's pray together, okay? Ready to pray, Bowden? Yeah, we're going to pray, okay? Noemi, let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for, for the privilege of raising these kids for you. And I pray your blessing on Evan and Erica and Nolan and Ashley as they raise these kids up to honor and follow you and to, to be a, a joy to the earth and to, the, to all of us. Now bless us in this endeavor, and we thank you for your interest and care. We devote our lives to, and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
Happy Sabbath. Today I'll be reading scripture from Acts 2, 42 to 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to everyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Early one Sunday morning in 2009, a seven-year-old boy led police on a low-speed chase through Plain City, Utah. Did you hear about this? The police tried to get his attention by turning on their flashers, but the boy refused to pull over. Instead, he continued to drive very slowly through town. The reason why he never sped up was because he was too short. He was too short to reach the pedals and look over the dashboard at the same time. So he would alternate between pushing the pedals and then jumping up to see where he was going. Well, this very dramatic chase finally came to a conclusion when the little boy pulled into his own driveway, hopped out of his car, and ran into the garage. When police finally asked him why he had taken his parents' car on this joyride, he responded, that he didn't want his parents to drag him to church because, get this, it was just too hot to go to church. I think some of us can identify with this little boy's sentiment, right? It's summer here in Loma Linda. It's when temperatures hit north of 110 degrees, it can feel too hot to go anywhere. And yet throughout this summer series, Project 242, we have been asking you to do exactly that to get out and to live out these discipleship practices. Practices like studying scripture in community, gathering around the table, praying for each other, serving our neighbors. And I'd like to pause here for a moment and just say how much, how much I've appreciated the messages that my colleagues have, have shared over the past four weeks. Have you been blessed? Amen. They've really given us a primer on how to engage in these, these foundational discipleship practices. So if you've missed any of the messages, I encourage you to go back and listen to them. They're all available online. You can go to our website, to our podcast, to our YouTube channel, and listen to them. Because the next three messages actually builds on the foundation laid by the first four. Now, having said that, these practices are nothing new. Christians have been participating in them for centuries. So for those of us who may have heard about them before, they can start to feel a little bit mundane, a little bit ordinary. And when they become inconvenient to participate in, we may start to wonder why we have to practice them in the first place. Like when we are tired, when we're busy, when it's too hot outside and we'd rather do something else. We may wonder, what difference do these discipleship practices make? Well, that's the question that we're going to answer over the next three weeks. Luke, in Acts chapter 2, verses 43 to 47, actually outlines three, three responses, three effects that participating in these discipleship practices made in the life of the early church. And they have the same effect today. And the first one is found in verse 43. So if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to get them out, open them up, launch the app, and turn over to Acts chapter 2. We're going to actually start in verse 42 for context and then move into verse 43. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Luke writes, And they, that is the early Christians, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayer. So they devoted themselves to these foundational discipleship practices. And then 
as a result of participating in those practices, awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. Luke writes that awe came upon every soul. So awe is the first response to a life of discipleship. So let me ask you, have you ever been in awe? Have you ever had an experience that just shocked you out of your daily, daily routine and left you in wonder? Maybe it was the first time that you stood at the edge of the Grand Canyon and looked down and realized how incredibly deep it was. Or maybe it was the first time you held your baby in your arms and you realized how incredibly small she was. Or maybe it was a time when, when God moved so powerfully in your life and you realized how incredibly big he was. See, those moments, they wake us up and they grab our attention. Have you ever been in awe? Those moments of awe are powerful because they give us, they give us a perspective that is often lacking in our self-centered existences. And Jacob Needleman, Jacob Needleman is a writer that was present at the launch of Apollo 17. And he writes about the profound effect of awe that awe had on everybody who was there to witness it. He writes, I was an observer at the launch of Apollo 17 in 1972. Now, for those of us who are too young to remember the launch of Apollo 17, it was the last time that humans actually set foot on the moon. He said it was a night launch, and there were hundreds of cynical reporters all over the lawn, drinking beer, wisecracking, and waiting for this 35-story high rocket. The countdown came, and then the launch. The first thing you see is this extraordinary orange light, which is just at the limit of what you, are, you can bear to look at. Everything is illuminated with this light. Then comes this thing slowly rising in total silence because it takes a few seconds for the sound to come across. You hear a whoosh and a hmm, and it enters right into you. You can practically hear jaws dropping. The sense of wonder fills everyone in the whole place as this thing goes up and up. The first stage ignites this beautiful blue flame. It becomes like a star, but you realize there's humans on it. And then there's total silence. People just get up quietly, helping each other up. They're kind, they open doors, they look at one another, speaking quietly and interestedly. These were suddenly moral people because the sense of wonder, the experience of wonder, had made them moral. See, that is the effect of awe. Wonder makes us better. Awe puts our lives in proper perspective. And according to Jennifer Steller, an assistant professor of psychology at the University of Toronto. We all need a little bit more awe and wonder in our lives, especially in this pandemic-scarred world. She writes, we share a universal problem right now. We're all busy and stressed and maybe even more self-involved because of the pandemic. Social isolation may be contributing to a tendency to ruminate more or even be narcissistic, which is related to ego. But experiencing awe can quiet the ego. Awe quiets the ego. Awe puts our lives in proper perspective. It helps us to realize that we are not the center of the universe, that the world does not revolve around us. And that's why we need awe. In fact, we crave awe. We crave those moments when we feel we feel appropriately small, but a part of something incredibly big. We crave those moments when it is clear how great God is. We crave those moments when the problems that we are normally obsessed about start to feel a little more insignificant. We need awe. And yet too often, those moments of awe are few and far between. 
And that's what's so incredible about what happened to these first Christians. Because they experienced awe continually. Luke writes that awe kept on coming upon them. See, the verb that he uses is in the imperfect middle tense, which if you didn't bring your Greek grammars to church this morning, it means that awe was a continual state. That awe kept on coming upon them. The same is true of the, uh, the signs and wonders. The apostles kept on performing their signs and wonders. This was not a one and done situation. This was a continual state. This thing that we crave, they had consistently. And that, that is the first response. That is the first result of participating in these discipleship practices. Repeated awe. See, participating in discipleship practices shifts our perspective. Can I say that again? Participating in discipleship practices shifts our perspective toward awe. Because through these practices, we encounter God. And God, when we see him, when we really see God, we can't help but be in awe and wonder. Just think about creation. Think about how awe-inspiring creation is. Think about the world, how magnificent the world is. Astronauts talk about this all the time. How looking at the world from space is a profound, unforgettable moment. There's never been an astronaut that, who takes a rocket to space and looks down on the earth for the very first time from orbit and says, eh, nothing special. No, every single one of them is overwhelmed by awe. And God created all of that. How could we not be in awe of our creator? And that's why Luke in the book of Acts, he always connects the word signs to the word wonders because he wants, he wants his readers to understand that these wonders that they experience, the wonders they see in nature, the, the wondrous miracles that the apostles perform, they are just signs pointing to the greatness of God. They're like, they're like samples of God's power. Anybody else here miss Costco samples? Yeah, yeah. I used to love walking around Costco and trying all the little samples. You could almost make a whole meal out of it, right? You get full. But that's not actually what the samples are for. The samples were just to be a taste of what is to come. And that's what these wonders are. These miracles that the apostle performed were just a taste of what is to come. These, these miraculous, uh, these breathtaking sights in nature, they are just a taste of what is to come. They are samples of the power and majesty of God. That's why in Psalm chapter 19, verse 1, King David wrote, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Because creation testifies of the creator. It's kind of like a painting. You know, nobody looks at a painting and marvels at the materials used to create it, right? Nobody looks at the Mona Lisa and goes, man, that is some amazing paint. Got to get myself some. Nobody looks at, at the Mona Lisa and asks the question, I wonder where Leonardo da Vinci got, got that canvas because that canvas, mm, magnificent. No, we don't marvel at the materials. We are in awe of the artist. And just as art shows the skill of the artist, creation testifies of the talent of our creator. So we don't have to manufacture these moments of awe and wonder. We just have to get out of our heads long enough to be able to see God in his works. That's why Elizabeth Barrett Browning writes that earth's crammed with heaven and every common bush afire with God, but only he who sees takes off his shoes. The rest sit rounded and pluck 
blackberries. I love that. God is all around us. We just need to stop plucking the blackberries long enough to see him. And that's what these practices do. That's what studying scripture in community, that's what building community, that's what uh, serving our neighbors, that's what praying for each other do. They allow us to encounter God. And when we encounter God, we experience awe. That's why these seemingly ordinary, ordinary practices open up extraordinary possibilities because through them, we encounter an awesome God. And some of you have already begun experiencing this. Some of you have already begun engaging in these discipleship practices and, and, and have experienced the shift that comes, the shift in perspective that comes from encountering God. I want to share one such experience with you this morning. It comes from one of our Meals on Wheels volunteers. She writes, I've been helping at Meals on Wheels for about two years now. I thought it would be an easy way to help someone in need, no strings attached. What I found was a rewarding way to give back to people. I have some friends on my route now who look forward to seeing me every Wednesday. I'm always greeted with a hug and a smile and I'm invited into their home and share my life with them. I listen to stories about their past. I even helped one lady search for her glasses for an hour. What I've realized is I may be the only person that they see all day. God has put me in their lives not only to be of service, not only to be of service, but because it makes me realize each and every one of us is special. See, what began as an easy way to do an act of service turned into an encounter with God that shifted her perspective. We have no idea what wonders, what awe-inspiring moments God has in store for us if we would just take the time to engage with him through these discipleship practices. So if we want a life full of awe and wonder, not just momentarily, but consistently, if we want those moments where we feel appropriately small but a part of something incredibly big, if we want those moments where it is absolutely clear how great God is, if we want those moments where we are sure that God is working in our lives, then we must engage in these discipleship practices. Because when we do, we, we encounter God. And when we encounter God, we experience awe. When you came in today, you should have received a card like this. It says Project 242 on it. If you have it, I'd encourage you to pull it out. We like to call this our live out challenge because it outlines practical ways to live out the principles that we've been learning about throughout this series. And my live out challenge for you this morning is really simple. It's to participate in one of the previous four live out challenges, to participate in one of those practices that lead to awe. So here are your options. This week, we invite you to participate in one of the previous four Live Out Challenges. Be intentional. That's option number one. Be intentional about having a conversation with someone you haven't talked to in a while. Number two, invite someone to your table for a meal. Number three, volunteer in an outreach ministry in your local area or ask God to inspire you to create a new ministry. Or option four, Pray intentionally for someone who God is calling you to intercede for. And then share how this experience changes your perception of this world. Now, these challenges, they may not seem like much. But it is incredible how God can take ordinary practices and open up extraordinary possibilities. One of my favorite stories that reminds me of what God can do if we just give him a chance it comes from an email that I received a long time ago. It was one of those chain emails. Do you remember those chain emails that used to circulate? So this story came from that long ago time, but it is so poignant that I still remember it to today. 
It's about a little girl named Livy. And Livy, while she was shopping with her mother, saw these pearls in a display case. And as soon as she saw those pearls, she knew she had to have them. It didn't matter that they were fake. They were still the most beautiful things she had ever seen in her entire life. So Livy turned to her mother and begged her, Mommy, please, 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 can I have those pearls? And her mother said, yes, but only if you pay for them. The price tag read $19.99. So as soon as she got home, Livy opened up her piggy bank and then started counting out her money. She had exactly $5.23, not enough to buy those pearls. But she didn't let that stop her. She started earning money. And several weeks later, she had earned enough money to purchase those prized pearls. And from that moment on, she never stopped wearing them. She wore them at home. She wore them at school. She wore them at church. She even wore them to bed. The only time she ever took them off was when she was showering because her mom told her that they might turn her skin green if she wore them and got wet. Livy also had a father who every night would come and read her a story before he tucked her in. And on this one particular night, after he had finished the story, he asked her a question. He said, Livy, do you love me? She said, oh, Daddy, of course I love you. Then can I have those pearls? A little bit shocked. She said, no, I, I love these pearls, but, but you can have my horsey. It's a really special horsey. It's, its legs move and everything. Her daddy smiled and said, no, Livy, that's okay. Daddy loves you. Kissed her and left. The next night, he came in and told her a story, and then he asked her again, Livy, do you love me? She said, Daddy, of course I love you. Then can I have those pearls? No, Daddy, not the pearls, but, but you can have my doll. It's my favorite. She's my favorite doll. I've had her since I was three years old. You can have her. Her daddy smiled and said, no, Livy, that's okay. Kissed her on the cheek tucked her in and left. The third night, the scene repeated again. He walked into the room, read her story, and then asked, Livy, do you love me? Daddy, you know that I love you. You know how much I love you. Of course I love you. Then can I have those pearls? Not the pearls, but you can have my dollhouse you can have my doll, and you can have the horse for her to ride on. You can have all of them. That's how much I love you. Her daddy smiled and said, no, Livy, that's okay. Daddy loves you. Kissed her and tucked her in and left. On the fourth night, things were a little bit different. Livy was waiting on her bed as usual, but the pearls were no longer around her neck. They were in her lap. And as soon as her daddy stepped into the room, she offered them up to him and said, Daddy, I love you. And with tears in his eyes, he reached out with one hand to grasp those fake pearls. And then with his other hand, he pulled out genuine pearls to place upon her neck. See, he had them the whole time. He was just waiting for her to give him a chance. So it is with our God. We have no idea the wonders, the awe-inspiring moments that God has in store for us if we'll only give him a chance. So I encourage you to live out these discipleship practices because if you do, you may discover how awesome and awe-inspiring. How powerful and untamable. How indescribable and uncontainable a God He truly is. This is our chance, my awe-inspired friends, to stand 
and sing with all of your heart to our great and amazing God. From the highest of heights to the depths of the sea, creations revealing your majesty. From the colors of fall to the fragrance of spring Every creature unique in the song that it sings All exclaiming, indescribable, uncontainable You place the stars in the sky and you call them by name You are amazing God Untamable, awestruck, we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim, You are amazing God. Who has told every lightning bolt where it should go? Or seen heavenly storehouses laden with snow? Who imagined the sun and gives source to its light, yet conceals it to bring us the coolness of night? None can fathom, indescribable, uncontainable. You place the stars in the sky and you know them by name. You are amazing God. All powerful, untamable, awestruck, we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim. You are amazing God, indescribable, uncontainable. You place the stars in the sky and you know them by name. You are amazing God, incomparable, unchangeable. You see the depths of my heart and you love me the same. You are amazing God. You are amazing God. Indescribable uncontainable God. We invite you to draw near to us as we engage in these practices. Draw near to us and show us your face. Show us who you are and leave us in awe and wonder. Allow that awe and wonder to transform the way that we think and that we live. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.
Hello, good friends. So glad to be with you again. We have a number of dear friends we're going to be greeting today. Here at Media at University Church, we're making some changes and we need your help. The best way for you to request greetings is to come through the church website. Have somebody help you find the church, Loma Linda University Church app, and go to the website, look for forms, F-O-R-M-S, and through forms, you'll find something that says birthday announcements. Click on that, and below you will find the way for Pastor Dan to read about your request for greetings. I'll run through that with you again another time, but let's try it. Go to the website. It's the best way to make your requests. I'm going to start today with Jim and Ruth Smith up at Walla Walla, Washington, who are marking their 66th wedding anniversary this month. Warmest congratulations to you two as we see you where you were and where you are. Congratulations. Hello, Wayne and Linda Darnell, Carolina Shores, North Carolina. And you two have been married 20 years. Warmest congratulations to you. Love to see you happy folks. Jonathan Macias lives out in Beaumont, not too far away here, and is marking a 17th birthday. Warmest congratulations, sir. Hello, Tara Johnson. Always glad to be in touch with you out at Calamesa. And look at you, having a great time someplace. And it seems you found a cooler place these days with family. Rosetta Vaughn Inns, Indianapolis, Indiana. 95th birthday lady. Yes, you were a lot younger once, and you're still a young 95. Warmest congratulations to you. Hello, Kim Ortner, Windsor, California. Glad to be in touch with you and know about your birthday, and I send you best greetings, lady. Carol Grady, Snohomish, Washington. Can't believe it, Carol. Our age, 85 years of age. You look wonderful, and I'm so delighted to be in touch and to greet you with a happy birthday, and hello to Bob as well. Bina Raj Singh, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, marking a birthday. Dear lady, glad to see you there with husband Raj and also with your son, Yash. Wow, what a happy family. Hello, Junior Shida, a part of our Villa family right here in Loma Linda. So glad to know about your birthday and I send you the best as well. Jean Bergdorf, you are so loved. Friends sent me these pictures of you and said, please let Jean know how important she is in this University Church family. Warmest congratulations on your birthday, Jean. Irene and Benjamin Tang, marking 30 years of marriage. Congratulations, you two, as I see you in some of your social environment and then in a happy place enjoying your anniversary. Krista Woodruff, right here in Loma Linda, part of the time, and in Spokane, Washington. Congratulations on your birthday, lady, and also glad to see you enjoying a family time at a wedding, looks like. Esther and Conrado and Yano, right here, part of University Church family, and your birthdays are pretty close to each other, and I'm here to wish you both a very happy birthday. Nellie Francis. Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Happy birthday, lady. So glad you join us from up there in Canada. Cheryl and Jim Leonard, Kirkland, Washington. Yes, I once got to be a pastor there. So glad you folks are there now and both of you have birthdays near each other about now and I wish you the very, very best. Hello, Glenn Nickel, a part of University Church, home in Grand Terrace. There you are with dear Jody, and there you are with granddaughter and what neat great grandchildren. Congratulations, Glenn. Patrice Correa. Listen, folks, this lady joins us from the United Kingdom. Welcome, Patrice, 
and very happy birthday to you, Lolita and Scott Campbell, a part of our family here at Loma Linda, married nine years now. Warmest congratulations to you two, and glad to see you last Sabbath and every week as far as that's concerned. Hello, Janet Brock, Abbotsford, British Columbia, there with that handsome man as you mark another birthday as well. Congratulations. Oscar Boismere, Houston, Texas. Listen, folks, 98th birthday this young man celebrates, and there he is with his wife. Congratulations to you on your birthday, Oscar. Oren Reiswig, Chico, California, 90th birthday. All the best to you, I think, with a daughter, Colette, and with other members of your family. Warmest congratulations, Oren. Pastor Fitzroy Maitland and wife Janice, Oshawa, Ontario, Canada, marking an anniversary. All the best to you two. Warmest congratulations. Barbara and Ernie Steiner. Look at that. 50 years ago in the Eugene, Oregon Church. Yes, I was once a pastor there too and got to work with your dear parents, Barbara. Warmest congratulations to you two on your 50th anniversary. Angela Picart McIntyre, Toronto, Canada. Warmest congratulations on your birthday, lady, and glad to see you there with dear husband, Don. Hello, Donna Webb, Longmont, California. You're over there with Voice of Prophecy Ministry now, but you used to be with Faith for Today. I wish you a very happy birthday, Donna. Hello, dear Helen Rodiasic, right here in Redlands, California, part of our Loma Linda family. 90th birthday, congratulations. What a happy lady. And I'm so glad Betsy and I got to see you recently. Claude Albert Fortune, Luton, Bedfordshire, United Kingdom. Hey, welcome, man. So glad to have you be a part of our family here in Loma Linda as well. Hello, Daryl Oak. Wow, you remind me of so much history back in Oregon Conference days. You still live in Bend, marking an 81st birthday, I understand. And I wanted to give you a special shout out, Daryl. Congratulations. Robert Yabara. more history, more memory. Well, I remember you when you were 10 or 12 years old at the Camarillo Church. Now you're 47 on this birthday and look at you there with the wonderful women in your life. Hello, Sarah and Ethan Castillo, a part of our University Church family. And yes, I know Ethan was your birthday present, Sarah, 14 years ago. Congratulations to you too as you celebrate your birthdays. And Romeo Race, a part of our University Church family, marking an 80th birthday, and your family wanted me to see you there enjoying great-grandchildren. I hear you're a great father, grandfather, and great-grandfather. Congratulations. And Owen Spencer, dear friend, we enjoyed traveling together, didn't we? You're from Horseshoe, North Carolina, marking your 85th birthday, and I wish you and Sandy the very, very best, and the very, very best to all the rest of us for the coming week.